morning. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you Lisa Colby. Uh, she is a certified meeting uh, professional, CMP, with 20 years experience in corporate event management, including selection of professional speakers, entertainment activities for technical conferences, and sales uh, achievement trips. Now, she is a past board member of MPI New England and was the co-chair of MPI New England's Educational Institutes 2009 through 2011. Uh, she currently is a full-time sales executive and part-time event planner for the Colt Group. She lives in Waitsfield, Vermont, and has traveled all the way down here to wow. be at this meeting. So I'm going to encourage uh, her to just do her presentation, and if you can, take questions, make this very interactive so that they get the most from your presentation. I think we're going to learn a lot from what she has to share about what meeting planners look for in speakers. So take it away, Lisa. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everyone. and. Uh, Glad to be here. Thank you, Bill and, uh, and Liz. So I uh, enjoyed hearing all of your talks. That was great. Um, so let's see, where do we want to start? I think um, let's go to slide, uh, the next slide, Mike. The charming, you know, okay, oh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> My charming and wonderful assistant, Mike, is going to be helping by assisting the slide, uh, advancing the slides. So, um, Thanks to Bill, I have updated my LinkedIn photo, uh, the one that was posted on uh, your website for this event was from at least 10 years ago and uh, I listened to one of Bill's talks and realized I need to update it. So when you see my new picture and you meet me now, you might realize I do have 20 years experience uh, doing event planning and I'm very proud of that and I, I love being a, uh, a meeting professional. It's uh, of all the things that I do in life, it's one of the things I get the greatest satisfaction from. And I'm a speaker also. I just came back from Salt Lake City where I gave a presentation at an industry conference. And so part of the job at the Colt Group that I told you about, I go to industry events and talk about what the company does. And then I also go into boardrooms and meeting rooms and present to either one person one-on-one -on -one or to a group of uh, 20 people at a company. So um, working on my speaking skills is, is very important to me. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is meeting planning. And um, in the, the 20 years that I was doing meeting planning, I worked for the telecom industry for about 10 years. And in that group, I was doing sales achievement trips um, where we would take the top performers somewhere beautiful in the world and uh, give them some kind of wonderful motivational speaker. That was, that was pretty exciting. And the CEO of that company was also one of the best uh, presenters that I've ever come across. Uh, then that led to my current uh, my previous job actually uh, with the Doble Engineering Company where I worked for 10 years and we hosted technical conferences all around the world for the electric power industry. So engineers would, electrical engineers would come to these conferences, be anywhere from you know, 100 people uh, someplace in Europe to the biggest event I did was 1,200 people at the Westin Hotel Copley Place and uh, that event at the Westin uh, just this last year was the 80th consecutive year they've done it. So uh, this was a, a company where um, they were really key on sharing knowledge within the industry. And so at each one of these annual events, the one in Boston, they would have five to six days of um, sessions. We had a total of a hundred presentations in that week. And so I was responsible for overseeing all the arrangements of the event. The budget, the goals, what the theme was, how are we going to communicate and get attendees to come to it, selecting those 100 presenters, selecting a keynote speaker, entertainment, food and beverage. You'll see why, as I talk about it, what, an, what a meeting professional does is uh, very diverse uh, and uh, the, selecting the presenters is um, just one aspect, but it really is the most important aspect. I'm going to read to you. Um, I've got some handouts I'll give you afterwards, which are from the CMP textbook, the, the study book that's used for the exam. And it's all about um, selecting speakers so that you can see what meeting professionals are looking for in speakers and what their checklists are so that you're aware of them. So I'm going to just read to you from the introduction of the section on hiring speakers and working with speaker bur bureaus. The importance a speaker plays in the success of your meeting cannot be overstated. A report conducted by the MPI Foundation, that's Meeting Professionals International, by the MPI Foundation titled Making Meetings Work, an Analysis of Corporate Meetings, 
showed that well-prepared speakers ranked number one among attendees on a list of key meeting success factors. So you're number one. Now it seems like, well, that's pretty obvious. People would come because they want to hear who's speaking, but not necessarily. Sometimes people are going because they you know, want to go to the US Virgin Islands or everybody else is going and they want to network with their buddies. But it's the speakers and the quality of the speakers that are number one. And anybody who's a meeting professional knows that. And uh, you know, the relationship that you're going to have with them and them with you is, is critical. So um, then in addition to what I did at this uh, engineering firm, um, then I've been actively involved with Meeting Professionals International. And I'll tell you a little bit about them. Um, they had two month, two uh, annual educational institutes, so a, a one or two day institute twice a year, and I was the chair of those um, events for um, for a couple of years, and um, <clears throat> that's how I met Bill through your your friend uh, and co-speaker there. Is it Dwayne? Dwayne. Um, Dwayne was a speaker there on uh, sales uh, techniques, and I heard him a couple of times and thought he was uh, wonderful. Um, and then I've also been an um, advisor to the industry um, since people n know me from the work that I've done with these technical conferences. I get asked to serve on advisory committees for uh, new events being started and how to uh, improve uh, events. So, all right, next slide, if you would, Mike. So I'm going to talk about who, who is a meeting planner, what makes them tick, have you understand uh, what's going on in their head, how speakers are selected, and how you can increase your chances of getting selected. And then I've got some uh, takeaway uh, lessons that I, I hope will be helpful. So next slide. So um, this is just a brief collage of a few of the presenters that uh, um, I thought were kind of interesting, although I have to tell you that you know, the type of presentations that I'm hearing today in some ways are more beneficial and more relevant to, to me and I think to the average person than some of these more glamorous ones. But um, in the upper left there, Charlie Tremendous Jones was uh, one of the speakers at uh, Sales Achievement Trip. Jeff uh, was there with me for, for that. Um, upper right, a little more recently, we had at Adobe Conference, we had, I think it's, uh, is that called the Tuttle? Uh, it's Orange County Choppers, that guy in the upper right. Wow. So yeah, uh, he came in. They were looking for something at uh, uh, one of these engineering conferences, looking for a keynote speaker that they thought the predominantly male audience would be interested in. And so they, they thought of him, and he actually came in riding a, uh, a, a custom chopper that had been designed for one of the sponsoring companies, Siemens, and it was an all-electric chopper, and so he came in and spoke. Um, and then uh, uh, lower left is a gentleman from, um, he's, he's, his nickname, I guess, is Houston. Um, he was from the Apollo uh, mission where, uh, Houston, we have a problem, right? And uh, he was the one in the white vest. He came in and spoke. That was that was wonderful. Uh, Leonard Skinner, uh, we had coming in as a as a as a band for one event, and that's another story. And then uh, Rudy Rudy Rudiger um, uh, was one of our speakers uh, at at a recent event. And then Charlie Plum, I'm going to tell you about him later on in my presentation. I think he was of all of the professional speakers of this sort of caliber that we hired and paid for out of a speakers bureau, I would have to say Charlie Plum was the most memorable of my life. And so I'll tell you a little bit about him and why he was uh, so, so good. All right, so, because really, um, and I'll talk about it later, but really it's n the success of a speaker is being able to connect with your audience and finding, having them find something relevant, something that they can put to use from what you've said. Okay, so next slide, Mike. So, who is the meeting planner? So you know that. Um, so, the meeting planner that you're dealing with is prob predominantly female. I'll just be honest about that. There are some men who do it, but it's probably 90% female. And it could be somebody inside the company. A lot of large companies will have uh, someone dedicated as a meeting planner, meeting organizer. Sometimes they'll have an entire team. Uh, but quite often, it's somebody who's got another responsibility. Um, I was also, in my role, responsible for marketing communication. So it's often somebody in marketing who also has the um, event role, because in marketing, you're talking, you're 
communicating with the customers, you're updating the website, and so those uh, aspects get involved with uh, events as well. So it might be a marketing person, often it's an HR uh, person also, might be tasked with being the meeting planner. And then you'll find a lot of executive assistants to this chief executive officer will be the meeting planner because a lot of events are being run by the, the CEO saying, this is what I want, this is the message I want to give the people, and he has his executive assistant be the person who's the organizer for them. And then you'll also have outside firms. There are outside firms that specialize in meeting planning. A group called Merits is one of them that I know of. Um, it's a whole, whole number of different groups where a company will outsource and hire uh, one of these organizations and their teams to run meetings for them. And so what you need to do is just look at who are your key targets, who are the companies you want to reach, do a little research and you'll be able to find out, um, and I can, I can tell you how you can find out, who their meeting planners are so that you can do a marketing approach to the, to the right individual or the right firm. <clears throat> so I have to tell you that one, one of my messages for you is to, bless you, one of my messages for you is to respect the meeting planner because whether it's somebody who's a dedicated meeting professional with the CMP title or whether it's the person in HR who's doing the meetings, whether it's the executive assistant, we never feel like we get any respect. You know, our own mothers don't understand, my mother's like, I don't understand what you do. And then my mother's girlfriend's like, so you're like a wedding planner, right? And people just don't understand, uh, unless they really are working in the trenches with you, how much work is involved, how much stress is involved. Um, you get great satisfaction from being a meeting professional, but people just don't seem to give you credit. And even within your own company, they're, you know, you're taking care of every detail, and people are sort of like just patting you on the back, like, nice, yeah, yeah, Lisa takes care of the events. So the more you can do to say, when you meet the meeting professional, I have to tell you, I have incredible respect for what you do. To, I know your job's really, really challenging. I know it's really tough. Respect what they're doing, and that goes a long way because they don't hear it that often. And that's one of the reasons that an organization like Meeting Professionals International and also being involved with getting a CMP designation is so, so satisfying for us as meeting planners because it, you get to talk to other people who are doing the same thing you do and you can support each other. In the company I, I worked at before, we had 300 employees. I was the only, when I started, I was the only person doing meetings. And we did 50 meetings a year, including this 1,200 person one, and I was the only person doing it in a, in a world of 300 male engineers who just thought of it as like, you know, oh, that's one of the things Lisa does. So I started going to these association meetings and what a relief to be able to share experiences and frustrations with other meeting professionals. So if you, you know, understand what they're all about and how tough their job is, you're going to make a friend right away because you're going to respect them and they're going to say, okay, this person gets it, they're going to make my life easier. So next slide. So, and what is a meeting planner? A meeting planner is someone who is very detail organized, very detail oriented, highly organized. Let's see if I got my notes about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll just wing it. So, the meeting planner is someone who, just by nature, is somebody who everything's an Excel spreadsheet, everything's a list, uh, everything is notes, everything is, you know, it's phone calls, it's, it, you know, their mind is just going all over the place. And keep in mind, like I said, usually this person isn't just the meeting planner, they're also doing another job. All right, next slide. This will help you understand. Uh, okay, so then the uh, CMP and CMM designations. If you see somebody, who in their title, they've either got CMP or CMM under their name, this means they have gone through a very intensive, extensive training program and test to get that designation. That's not to say that if somebody doesn't, go th doesn't have it, that they're not equally qualified or equally um, you know, good at what they're doing. Uh, but some of us have, have decided to get this designation. Um, it takes, number one, to get the designation, you have to fulfill certain criteria of being in a position where you're actually managing events, you're responsible for events, you're responsible for budgets, 
um, you uh, have to have a certain amount of money to invest in uh, paying for the fees to, to get this. And sometimes your company will do it, which is uh, fortunate. Or, and you have to have the time to devote to it because it, it, takes, it takes some time. You have to study. You join a study group. You take a test. All of us who were in the study group and took the test, we were all sure we didn't pass. I mean, it, it was very stressful. It's a big deal when you get one of these designations. And uh, so this was uh, a photograph of uh, Karen King, who was the president um, at the time of MPI New England. And she was both a CMP and a CMM. A CMM is like getting your master's in meeting uh, professionals. It's, it really is it's like a graduate degree. And uh, so anyway, I just wanted you to be aware of it. Again, if somebody doesn't have the designation, it, it doesn't mean that they're not qualified or shouldn't be respected as much. But if you see that designation and they've decided to put it with their title on their signature, you know that it's important to them and they're proud of it. And you might want to just comment, say like, ah, I see your CMP. Wow, you know, that's, that's amazing. So, um, next slide, please. So, what makes us tick? So, remembering this is somebody who, you know, has multiple responsibilities, highly organized. Th these are people who really sweat the small stuff. Every detail is important, everything. And there's a lot of details in involved. Um, I, I don't know of, maybe, maybe you'll come across a meeting planner who isn't like this, but every single one I've met is like this. I can't imagine doing this job and not having that kind of checklist, you know, detail orientation there. So uh, the next slide will help you understand. So this is just one layer of what's going on in the brain. So you've got, you know, starting in the upper left there, food and beverage. So you're doing everything to figure out what the menus are, which is the, the funnest part of it, is to, to pick out the menus. But you're dealing with, you know, you're trying to come up with a menu that's right for the whole group. And then on day five of the event, I'd have a, co a, a guy come up to me and say, Lisa, I just want you to know, I'm allergic to uh, peppers, and it seems like everything you've had from the breakfast uh, eggs to the lunch to the dinner all had peppers in it, and I couldn't eat it. And I said, well, you know, Bill, you, sh you should have told me. I, you know, I sent out all these communications. If you had special food needs, you should have told me. I would have, the chef would have been happy to make something special for you. No, 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 that's okay. I didn't want to be a bother, but I just wanted you to know. <laughs> Stuff like that, you know, and different people's allergies. And then, you know, you might have a case that somebody, you find out somebody didn't come down to a session in the afternoon because something they ate didn't agree with them. So you got to follow up and find out, oh my God, was there something bad? Did they get food poisoning? Report it to the chef. That's just one aspect. And then the communication, setting up online registration, um, you know, and, and then you're dealing with all the different people in the company, you know, the CEO, you've usually got a committee of people that you're working with. Everybody's got their own ideas. Everybody's got their own suggestions of what you should do. They don't always agree on it. And I wanted to point out this one here, safety plan. What a lot of people don't realize is the number one most important um, responsibility of the meeting professional is the safety of the attendees. It's sort of like the flight attendant that you, you know, yeah, you think, well, they're, they're bringing you the, the drinks and the snacks, but their number one responsibility is the safety. And uh, so that person who's taking care of all these other details, they also have to be thinking, if right now I as a speaker, and I had a wonderful, wonderful speaker at an MPI event do this, she was a lawyer and a meeting planner, and she got up in front of the group of us and she said, okay, I'm having a heart attack right now, what's your plan? And you've got to know, okay, you, in the room, who's designated, you know, is everybody just going to go running off in different directions? Who's going to go and get help? Who knows where the closest defibrillator is? Who knows how to use it? And then if you dial, somebody says, oh, I'll dial 911, and you pick up the local phone or your cell phone, and you dial 911, that comes to the front door of the hotel, not to the side door. And some of these complexes you're doing events in can be, you know, Huge. So how do you make sure? So the event planner is making sure that the safety of the attendees is number one. And that's something that a lot of people don't realize. So that's number one responsibility. And then after that is, what are the goals of the event? Are the goals being met? What's the budget? Is the budget being met? And is everybody happy? Everybody attending, all the stakeholders. So it's, it's an enormous responsibility, but one that we really love and there's nothing like the sense of fulfillment when an event's over and you know it went it went well i used to have 
people come to me on, on uh, day one, and again, this was a predominantly male engineering audience, day one and through day three, they'd be coming to me, oh, Lisa, you know, you've got um, the notepads you're providing, you know, you really should do graph paper and legal size, and if the pens could, instead of a highlighter on the back, I'd be getting those kind of suggestions, you know, and I was trying to help, like, oh, okay, maybe I should do that. And then the last day of the event, people would come by the registration desk where I was sitting, and they'd say, Lisa, you look so different. You're all smiles now. You were, you were frowning earlier in the week. You're all smiles now. I'm thinking, like, it's over. <laughs> because it just felt so good to have it accomplished and, again, be something else. I checked off the list. Another event done and done well. So, um, but anyway, so it, I just wanted you to understand all those things that are going on uh, in the meeting planner's brain. All right, next slide. So I talked about that. Um, I think I also should just mention, we don't need to go back to the last slide, but if you, if you come across a meeting planner and they seem to be serious to you, um, they seem to be serious, you're trying to tell them about what you do and they just don't seem that receptive, I don't want you to take it personally because you think of all those things going on in their brain and you got you got to hit them at the right moment. So don't take it personally if they seem to be all business or they seem to be kind of cold and unemotional with you. It's just because they're thinking about all of those other things. Um, so your job is going to be to try to make their life easier, as I said, keep your communications with them brief, and again, by understanding better how their brain works and what their job's all about, I think you'll be able to uh, relate to them uh, better. So, uh, how decisions are made. There are some organizations where the meeting planner does have the responsibility to, Lisa, or whoever it is, find us a presenter. I want you to come up with ideas for who's going to be the keynote speaker on this topic or, you know, just g give it open. And, and the meeting planner comes up with recommendations of who that, who that presenter should be. In a lot of cases, though, it is, um, coming from the CEO. Usually the CEO has somebody in mind that they've seen before or they've heard of before. Um, or somebody else in the executive team um, or the planning committee knows of somebody. So it's a lot of it is just word of mouth and somebody in senior management. But the meeting planner really can, can make or break it for you because they're going to be your ongoing communication. And so if you don't stay in touch with them, you don't give them you know, what they ask for in time, they can, they can derail you pretty quickly. And so they can either you know, make your life m miserable or they can make things wonderful and they're going to make sure your check gets, gets paid and, uh, and so on. So, but I just want you to be aware that the meeting planner is often an influencer as opposed to the key decision maker. And so that's where you, you're going to need to be networking with the CEOs uh, a lot of the time as well. Next slide. So how are you going to find meeting planners? How are you going to get them to know about you? The number one best way, I say, is attend their gatherings. Um, so MPI New England um, is based in the Boston area. Most of the uh, events uh, that they have are in the Boston area, but they've done th things in Connecticut, um, Rhode Island, they do travel around the greater New England area. But then I took a look, there's also a Hartford chapter of that, the CRV, Connecticut River Valley. Um, and each of these groups meets monthly. And what I would encourage you to do is just, they let, they let non-members come, you pay, a, you know, it's like members pay, you know, $20, non-members pay $40, whatever, and you go to one of these evening mixers and uh, get to meet people. If you're able to speak at one of their meetings, that's ideal to get up in front of the whole group. Uh, but just, just to go to the event and do what happened this morning here with all of us networking, that's what happens at these events. And you have maybe, you know, 50% of the audience at these events are meeting professionals. You've got, you know, Liberty Mutual, for example, the, the Boston chapter of MPI. Liberty Mutual must have had, you know, 10 people at every one of these monthly mixers because they had such a large uh, meeting planning team. So the big corporations would have uh, meeting planners there. Small, uh, you know, individual, sorry? Can I ask you a question? Sure. Why would, uh, tell me, why would uh, they let us come to their mixer? Because in addition to meeting planners being there, they also have suppliers and vendors. So the mix is about 50% meeting planners 
and 50% suppliers so that they can meet up with them and network. So uh, all of the major hotels in New England will send a representative to the monthly meeting and then um, you know somebody, I've got a friend Gail who uh, sells printed coffee mugs and pens and she goes and then uh, speakers also go to that also and I found it was great for me as a meeting planner to be able to, that's where I looked, uh, that was one of my key places to, to get business done because when I was in the office I just couldn't get everything accomplished. I'd go there and be like, oh, I need to talk to her. I want to talk to her about coming in. Oh, I wanted to ask her. And so I got a lot of business conducted hiring people at these events because it was a way to, you know, another just extra time in my day. And uh, the organization, uh, you know, is extremely supportive of that. They know that they need both the suppliers and the professionals getting getting together, and they really benefit so each other. Where I'm going on July 9th. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't gone to the Hartford area chapter meetings. What I'm familiar with is the uh, is the Boston chapter, but I have to think that it's it's all the same thing there. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. Are these also the same people that are involved in planning for trainings? Um, to a certain degree they would be because um, uh, maybe not always so maybe the person who's in charge of HR who is planning an internal training event for employees that person might also have the responsibility of doing some other meeting planning and so that person might be there okay. but then there I think you'd be missing out on other people you know so you're not going to get everybody but you're going to get some of them and you might get okay the, you know, the lady who's in charge of all meetings at Mass Mutual, you start chatting with her and she says, well, you know, in our company, it's this person who does that. So you're going to find out who the right person is if that person isn't there. That's for sure. Um, and this bottom picture, this is really important. Meeting planners, meeting professionals drink, like to drink wine. And the <laughs> best way, when I said before, they seem serious and businesslike and it's hard to get them to open up and relax and let you in. A glass of wine, and you, and that makes a huge difference. So, uh, one of this this friend of mine, Gail, who has been one of my best friends now for years, and a supplier of mine. I met her because we were waiting in line at one of these events for a glass of wine, and we just started chatting next to each other. And next thing you know, we're doing business together, and I'm hiring her. And so, that's when when I found is your best shot to get them to to uh, open up to you. So, um, the uh, this is uh, international. Uh, Conferences and Conventions Association. That's another association. I'm less familiar with it, but the um, MPI, I really strongly uh, advise you to get involved with that because they, you know, you're going to meet up with people that um, may have need for your services or for you to make a uh, presentation or they'll know of somebody, you know, it's just networking, it'll be great. And then if you can speak at their meetings, that's the other thing is, see if you can get on the slot. Each one of these, they do a, they do a monthly, um, they always have a keynote speaker every month for a brief presentation. And um, they've had, you know, I remember there was a great one, a lady whose specialty was corporate etiquette. And so she was in charge one month where um, she, had a group, you know, seated like this, and she and she got everybody to uh, the best technique for introducing yourself at a cocktail party. How do you get your message across without seeming pushy, but telling people what you do? That was that was a great thing, and it benefited her. She was trying to teach corporate etiquette, so that was a good way of her showing what she could do in action. And then MPI has uh, different educational congresses where they'll have a day or two days a year. Um, of training and it's everything from you know somebody like Bill would come in and speak or, du or Dwayne uh, came in and talked about sales strategies I every single one of you when I heard what you do you would be a, a you would be appropriate to speak to to the group um, and then as I said before the CEO is also a key person for you so the meeting professional you want to have them know about you, but those CEOs, they're the ones who are, if, if, they've, if they've heard of you or seen you in action, they're going to be the ones who say to the meeting professional, I want you to check this person out. And that, that, when I look at how people were selected, it always came down to word of mouth that somebody had seen you somewhere before. That, ah, my friend Joe was at an event and he told me about the speaker. What was that person's name? Something like, it was all somebody having seen you somewhere before. So the more you get out there and speak anywhere, the more your chances are increased that 
a CEO or a meeting professional are going to um, learn about you. All right, next one. How am I doing on time? All right, so then the handout I'm going to give you afterwards is just um, when you study for the CMP exam, you get these two big textbooks, and one of the chapters is uh, about hiring speakers. And so what I did was I just printed out copies of some of the pages from the textbook because if somebody went through the CMP process, this is a, they are going to be looking at this. So it just will help you rather than me coming up with my own checklist for you. I just plagiarized and said, okay, take a look at, at what they've got as checklists. Because if the meeting professional is saying, this is what I want to see. If I'm interviewing speakers, I want to see their bio, their testimon testimonials. I want references to be recent. This is all from what they're going to ask for from you. So you might as well have it available to them. Having a video available, it could be you know on YouTube that you send them a link. Maybe it's on your website. Put the information on your website, and then um, you know figure out who that who those target companies are that that you ha want to reach and do business with, and then invite the meeting planners from that group to go to your website. Ha invite the CEOs to uh, go to the website. Have them if you're presenting anywhere. You're presenting at this, uh, you know, one of these local events, invite those people to come and hear you because that's how it's going to happen. Somebody's going to hear you speak and then they're going to say, aha, we need that in our company or somebody else I know needs it. And then uh, part of the process of working, uh, a meeting planner working with a speaker is al always involves a conference call with usually it's the CEO, the meeting planner, and the uh, presenter so that you make sure that you get to know each other. Video of you in front of a live audience. I've always resisted putting that up because I've looked at a lot of them. They all look the same, and they all put clips up, and it's hard to get excited about it. I yeah. have plenty of video on my site. It's just not me in front of a live audience. Yeah. That's where I've got my, my second quote I wanted to read here, if I can find it. Okay, this is really important. The number one area of speaker criticism is the degree to which a speaker personalized his or her presentation or made it relevant to the group or event. Interestingly, the number one topic of speaker praise has to do with the same thing. Studies have clearly shown that well-prepared speakers are one of the key determinants of attendee satisfaction. And so the lesson to meeting planners, em establish a process that emphasizes and makes certain that those speakers you engage can and will thoughtfully account for your group and event in their presentation. So you need to do the research. If, if the meeting planner doesn't tell you about the event, you need to make sure and find this information out. What are the goals of the event? Um, how are you going to tie into that message? Um, what are they expecting? Are they, is this something they're going to learn something from or is it just going to be entertainment? Or sometimes it's both. Next slide. And so here's the checklist that they've got in here of what the meeting planner should be covering with you. But they might not always have time. They might be rushed. So it might be up to you to say, I'd like to make sure I have a good understanding of your group and what the event's all about. I'd like to schedule a conference call for 20 minutes with yourself and the CEO or the other appropriate decision maker to make sure that I, you know, that you brief me on what this event is about. That's something that's part of my process. You just every presenter I've worked with, every speaker I've worked with, th this is part of what they do. They have a, you know, they have an ag an agreement, a contract. They have they always have a conference call and then you know that's just part of the process and so you ask them questions you know who is the audience you want to understand you know who is the audience uh, you know do you want this presentation to be interactive anything in particular going on with the industry or with your company that I should be sensitive to um, key terminology um, again who's going on before me who's going on after me am I going on Am I going on after lunch? Am I going on before lunch? I mean, those, those always are important things to know and to sense the mood of your group. Um, any sponsors you should be aware of? You don't want to go and stick your foot in the mouth saying something about uh, somebody you shouldn't. 
And then one of the things that I always found I enjoyed most about speakers was the ones who came and were involved with the group, bef you know, as part of the event. They became part of the event. If somebody just came and showed up, it's like, okay, I'm on in 10 minutes, you know, and you said, okay, we want you to be there 10 minutes prior. Okay, they showed up 10 minutes prior, they did their talk, and they left. Usually they weren't as relevant to the group as the ones who came the morning of, maybe they came the day before, they hung out, they became part of the group, they made friends, you know, and then when they gave their presentation, they were really able to connect with the group. So anything you can do to um, enhance that networking aspect. And then afterwards, my God, if you just take off afterwards, you're missing out on the opportunity for all these people to come up to you when you're getting a cup of coffee later and ask for your business card because people, you know, right after your presentation, you might get, you know, three, four people coming right up and asking for your business card. And then you've got 10 other people in the audience who would like to, but they're a little shy and they're going to wait. So you hang around afterwards and uh, that can be really helpful for you. Uh, next slide. How am I doing on time? Five minutes? I'm already over, probably. No, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> I, think we're, I think we're learning a lot from this, so this is okay. Yeah. Good. So making a memorable experience. This isn't in the textbook, but for me, these were the ones that that worked uh, the best. Um, making it interactive always is good, and lighting and music. People overlook the things you can do with lighting and with with music, and it's going to make your presentation, your speech, stand out and it help you deliver your message and it's going to get you invited back and you're going to become the buzz that people start talking to. So the story I wanted to tell you was about the speaker Charlie Plum who I said was one of the best speakers I've ever heard. So Charlie Plum was a uh, fighter pilot in Vietnam and he had flown 74 successful missions and on his 75th mission when he had five days left to go before he was going to go home he was shot down and he was in a PO I get chills just thinking about it. He was, th he was that kind of speaker that you just like tingle, man. Six years he was in a POW camp. And so he did a presentation uh, for this telecom company where uh, his talk was about overcoming obstacles. And we had had a really challenging period in the company and sales were down, people were feeling pretty mopey, um, people were discouraged, they were overworked, and here we have Charlie come in and it was again the CEO had heard about him from someone else he'd spoken somewhere else seen him so Charlie's uh, white-haired uh, gentleman and we've got I'd say 200 people in the audience and the audience comes in and the room is just pitch black and you've got the podium podium there and then you've got a spotlight and Charlie starts off at the podium you can't even see me in the dark and he walks over into the spotlight. And the spotlight, as he starts to talk, he, he paces, it, paces it out. He paces slowly. Sorry, going in. Paces slowly, eight foot by eight foot. That was a spotlight. That was the amount of space he had for six years in the dark, eight, eight feet by eight. And just that simple thing of the spotlight and the dark light, just what, what a thing to do. It was incredible. And so he talked about how in the six years, um, he started with, they started over the first few months um, communicating with each other, the other prisoners, through Morse code. <coughs> they tapped on the sides of, uh, they found a place they could tap on a pipe so they could hear each other. So they started to communicate with each other because they were all in solitary confinement. And they started tapping and what they did over the course of a couple of years was they shared with each other their names their a and their addresses. So if any of them got out, they would be able to go back and tell their families so-and-so was there, he was still alive at this time. And so Charlie told this whole story and then he made it, he made it relevant to the people in the audience by talking about obstacles here. He came back, what happened? He came back after six years, couldn't wait to be home to his wife. She'd given up on him and married somebody else. She thought he was already dead. And, uh, you know, these sales guys who had been these big, tough, swaggering, th there wasn't a dry eye in the audience at the end. But the way he told the stories, it made you think of, here's what I'm going to do. I learned a lesson from this. He was able, and I don't, I don't have a good example for you, but he was able to tell this story in a way that you could say, I'm also feeling stuck. I'm also doing this. This is what I'm going to do. So here was a way that he gave a presentation that was relevant, which is one of the key things you want to look at, and he made it memorable by just that simple 
lighting feature. Next slide. No surprises. My god, that's the other thing. Meeting planners hate surprises because they're so organized and they don't want surprises. So the kind of surprise we don't want is if you're supposed to show up at a certain time, show up then. If you're supposed to talk for 20 minutes, talk for 20 minutes. If you're supposed to talk for 20, don't talk for 5 because then the group's going to break and they're going to be out there and the coffee service isn't out yet. You know, so whatever your expectations are, stick to them. And the other thing that's been an unpleasant surprise is somehow sometimes the commercial aspect of a speaker. Um, if you want to sh have a book, if you want to uh, promote your service or have business cards out in a pile or something, make sure and ask the meeting planner, <coughs> is it okay for me to do this? And if they say, if they aren't 100% supportive, you make sure you don't do it because that's a surprise that can be very unpleasant for you. I had a case of a of musical entertainment at an event and this person asked me said I've got some cassettes for sale and CDs can I bring them along and I said no I know for a fact that our CEO is not gonna be we're paying you to do this do not be selling your stuff so he got up and he did his first set and at the end of it he said I know I'm not supposed to say this but I got some CDs here if anybody's interested the CEO grabbed me took me out of the room at the break and said get him off and I had to go and tell him pack up your stuff Pack up your stuff, get off, we told you not to do that, get lost. Wow. Yeah, so, but then there's other cases where people say, you know, absolutely, bring your book, you know, Bill's here, he's got his books with him, you know, and they're going to be supportive of that. But if you give your speech properly, people are going to come to you, you know, they're going to find, they're going to be able to find you and, and get information from you. So you're always better to err on the side of caution with that, I've found, in, in certain situations, and that would be an unpleasant surprise for, for all involved. Next slide. So top takeaways, uh, number five, get out there, which is just the networking aspect. The more you can be out there networking, um, <coughs> talking to people, and also presenting everywhere you can because you never know who's in the audience, who's going to see you. Number four, be organized. Be super organized because the person you're dealing with is a highly organized person. Number three, be brief. If in your communications, keep in mind this person has got, you know, things, you know, a zillion things going on in their head. So this is somebody to be very brief and concise with in your communications, be understanding of their, uh, respectful of their time. Number two, no, wait, is that three? Oh, I guess I got my numbers wrong. So no surprises I told you about, don't like surprises. Number two, be relevant to the audience, do the homework so that you can customize <coughs> what you're talking about to the group. And number one, respect the meeting planner. If you can appreciate what you know, understand them and respect what they're going through and what they're dealing with and you make their life easier, you're going to give a great presentation and you're going to make them look great. And that's it. Thank you. Very good.